Okay, okay, welcome to church tonight. Who's excited to be here? Who's ready to worship and adore the Lord tonight? Who's ready to encounter Jesus in a profound way? Hope I'm speaking to the right people. Why don't you guys just quickly stand to your feet? Uh, before we get started tonight, you have some amazing people around you. Why don't you just take a moment to introduce yourself? Say hi. Amazing people, hey. All of you guys watching online too, so glad you guys are with us tonight. I'm going to have to like tell you guys to stop seeing you're so in love with each other. It's amazing. Guys, I'm going to dive right into the middle of a scripture tonight. Shh, shh, shh. Who likes the scripture? Who loves the Word of God? Good, I'm speaking to the right people. We're going to jump into Luke uh, chapter 7 really quick. You guys know these verses. Uh, I'm just going to jump kind of in the middle of the story here. Uh, and behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Oh, we know these verses really well, and we love to sing about them and preach about them and talk about them. I just felt like as we came um, to worship tonight, I wanted to just draw our attention to the reaction of this woman, she only went and grabbed an alabaster flask of fragrant oil when she knew where Jesus was. When she knew that Jesus was at the table in the Pharisee's house, she got her things organized and went to meet with him. How many of you are believing that tonight Jesus himself is going to be here with us? How many of you know that if Jesus is going to be meeting here with us, that even before we began, it would be smart for us to become aware of the fact that we get an opportunity to bring something costly and break it at His feet. So even before we start going into worship together, just, just take a moment and just become aware of the presence of Jesus here in this room. If you're watching online, become aware of the manifest presence of Jesus Himself all around you. Jesus wants to meet with us tonight. Jesus is here in this room. And Jesus, just like that woman, just like that sinner, when she knew that you were available, out of the overflow of her heart of love, she went and grabbed the alabaster jar because she knew that you were available to meet with. So tonight, Jesus, we recognize that you're here. So we posture ourselves to not just go through the motions of worship, not just go through the motions of another Sunday night, but we actually take stock and we say, Jesus, far be it from us to, to offer you something that didn't cost us anything. We posture ourselves before you and we say, Lord, we are here to give a costly fragrance tonight. We're here to give a costly offering to You. We want to break it at Your feet tonight. And we're not relying on anyone else around us to do that. We are going to meet with You and offer the fragrance of our love and affection over You tonight. So even just before the worship team starts to sing, why don't You just tell Him, maybe just begin to pray out loud. Lord Jesus, I plan to meet with You tonight. I plan to bring my oil. I, I plan to break it at Your feet tonight. I'm here to offer myself. I'm here to offer something costly to the one whom I love. 
Jesus, receive the offering of my love and my life tonight. That's it. Just let that praise and those declarations and that prayer just begin to seed the heavens. Just begin to seed the heavens in this room. That's it. That's it. Start the costly fragrance even now. So beautiful.
never runs out on me Cause your love never fails and never gives up It never runs out on me Your love never fails and never gives up It never runs out on me Oh, your love Oh
everything within me bless his name praise the lord oh my soul let everything within me bless his name praise the lord oh my soul let everything within me bless his
touch my heart like you do I could search for all eternity long And find there is none like you I could search
your violin. I just want you to lift your voice right now, more than a song. Lock eyes with the Lord.
feel compelled to read this scripture because oh he's loving the glory we are giving him right now Philippians 2 this is speaking of the incarnation of Christ which is why he will forever be called the Lamb of God that was slain but Jesus but have this attitude which was also in Jesus Christ who although he existed in the form of God he did not recall regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but he emptied himself and he took on the form of a bond servant and became made in the likeness of man being found in an appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross for this reason God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I want us to just celebrate and give God all the glory right now in your own way. Give God all the glory, all the honor, all the for going to the cross, for being the Lamb of God. Worthy is the Lamb. Sing holy, holy, holy is the Lord. We join in with the creatures, join in with the elders. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord.
Grace has found me just as I am. Empty handed, but alive in your hands. Majesty. Majesty. Forever. Forever I am changed by your love. In the presence of just reminded of the scripture that says that Moses would leave the tent of meeting but his assistant Joshua would stay in the tent being calibrated to his presence tonight we're just being recalibrated to what we're born for which is eternity heaven's realm <laughs> to worship to live atmosphere of his presence so why don't you just put your hand on your heart just ask the Holy Spirit to calibrate you to heaven to calibrate you to his presence every area my heart my soul my mind my spirit be calibrated to heaven
We were made for your glory, Lord. We were made to be your dwelling place, oh God. Thank you, Jesus, for paying a price so that we could live in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I just let him bring alignment to your life right now. If anything's out of whack, even in your body right now, just be calibrated to heaven. Let your body be calibrated. Let your emotions, let your thoughts, anything you're facing right now, right now, the reality of heaven is more real than all the other things. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your presence. Thank you for your presence, God. Thank you, God. You know, it's interesting that Joshua would go on to lead the children of Israel with Caleb into the promised land. It's because he really spent time in the glory. He could face anything. <laughs> he could take giants because he would calibrate it to the reality of who God was and is. Amen. Ah. <sighs> So put your hand on the person, beautiful person next to you. And just pray that they would be calibrated to his presence. That their body would respond in healing right now in his presence. That there would be healing. That there would be a restoration of minds. That there would be hearts filled with fire. <laughs> We're calibrated to you, God. We're calibrated to your reality, God. Thank you, God. We're calibrated to joy in your presence. And the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. Because he is the glorious, glorious Lamb of God who paid for everything. <laughs> we can rejoice because every debt has been settled. <laughs> Whew, every issue has been paid for. So we just access right now, just begin to pray that the access of heaven be released over your neighbor. Maybe it's finances, whatever their need in his presence is fullness of joy, fullness of delight. You are made to receive the delight of God. You are made to receive the pleasure of God. Thank you, God. Thank you, thank you. All of the honor is yours, Jesus. All of the glory is yours. All of the, the goodness belongs to you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Bless our neighbor. Whew. Calibrated to heaven tonight. Calibrated to heaven tonight. Thank you, God. I just feel like depression is leaving right now because we're calibrated to heaven right now. Whew. Thoughts of loneliness is, is right now being dispelled in Jesus' name. Emmanuel, God with us, God among us and God in us. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. In your presence is fullness of joy. Depression has to lift because of the presence of God. There is fullness of joy. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Fullness of joy. <laughs> uh, oh boy, we got something. Okay. <laughs> Put your hand in your neighbor. Fullness of joy. Come on, the joy of the Lord. The fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. At his right hand is pleasures evermore. God, I thank you that you paid for joy. You paid for joy. Woo! Not earthly joy, but eternal joy. Eternal delight right now. If you've, been, if you've been under a cloud, I want you to just lift that off right now. Just lift that cloud off of you right across this room. In the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. Of living water, 
recalibrated to heaven tonight. If you're watching online, if you've been under a cloud, I want you to just lift that off. The glory of the Lord is your portion. The joy and the delight of God, that's what He paid for. That's what He paid for. Thank you for joy. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, God. Increase. Wow. Thanks, God. More. Increase. Increase. It, there's a river of joy. He said it makes, there is a river whose stream may glad the city of God. Thank you. Thank you for your joy. Thank you for your delight. Woo. It's what Jesus paid for. It's what he paid for. He took a crown of thorns so that you wouldn't have those depressive thoughts. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Full, fullness of joy. In the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. So, <laughs> let him fill you with his delight. Let him fill you with his delight. <laughs> let the countenance of the Father, let, him, let his smile, it says that the countenance of God is radiating over his children. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. It says that his children will never be put to shame. <laughs> Thank you, God. Fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. Drink in the fullness. Drink in the fullness. not earthly joy, it's eternal joy. <laughs> Thanks, God. Thanks, God. Wow, wow. Increase, increase, increase. Woo. Increase, increase. Increase, increase. <laughs> Drink in the delight of God. <laughs> God is actually delighted in us. You know that. <laughs> Thank you, God. Thank you for your delight. Thank you for your delight, God.
joy. Thank you for joy, God. <laughs> Thanks, God. Thank you, God. If you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, just begin to lift up a heavenly language. Church. If your water level has been low, just feel, feel the water levels rising in your spirit. Just begin to lift up thanks. Just lift up thanks. Don't look at me, guys. Just lift up thanks. Lift up thanks. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Holy, holy, holy. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we yield to you. We yield to you. Shotorabate <laughs> aramaso. Shotorabate. <laughs> thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Just lift up thanks. Just, just lift up thanks. There's just a few more people that need the water levels to rise. So I'm just waiting on the Lord to just touch, just touch, just open up, open up and let Him fill you. Let Him fill you. Pray in the Spirit. Shate aramama so. He aramama ne aramama ne. So to ramashi arane. So to ramane. So to So to So to Calibrate to heaven. Calibrate to heaven right now. Calibrate, calibrate to heaven. Sotorama
level's rising. The water level's rising. <laughs> Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Fullness of joy. If you still feel low on joy, just be right now, just don't strive. Just receive His fullness. Receive His fullness. Receive His fullness. you for your peace, God. Let the peace of God just settle in right now. Just receive His peace. I just felt a shift. All of a sudden, I could feel His peace like a blanket coming on us. Woo! Let's just receive His peace right now. Oh, thank you, God. Oh, the peace of God, the peace of God. Be filled with His peace. Be filled with His peace right now. striving, all the stress, just let it float off of you right now. Whew, just a blanket of His peace right now. God. I really feel strongly. If you need peace, just actually just maybe even hold yourself like this, like, oh, like a child. Just receive his peace. Receive his peace. I just see the peace of the Lord wrapping around you like a blanket right now. Receive his peace. Whew. Receive his peace. Receive his peace. If you've been having bad dreams, put your hand on your head. Just let the peace of God. Thank you, God. Thank all across this room. Peace of God. Oh. Fill to the fullness. Fill to the fullness. of God. Oh, there it is. There it is. There it is. Thank you for the blanket of peace. Thank you, God. Now give him thanks. Just thank him for his peace. 
thank you for your peace, God. Thank you for your peace. sound up. Worship, the Lord told me that He was going to deliver people from anxiety tonight. That some of you, there's been an onset of anxiety. I, I saw a specific a young man, it started when you're seven years old, and He showed me that you're going to get set free. Is there anyone in this room you've been struggling with anxiety? You're a young man since you're seven years old. Something traumatic may have even happened, or you don't know right here. Thank you. Just lay your hands right here. The Lord, if you struggle with anxiety right now, just put your hands out in front of you or just on your head. Um, some of you have been wondering if you need to um, you need to get some help, and I just feel like the Lord today He is He is coming to deliver us from anxiety, and He's saying that um, the recognition of anxiety isn't the stronghold we find safety in; it is the submission of it to the Christ, to the Prince of Peace. And so, right now, in Jesus' name, we thank you, God, that you are the Prince of Peace. That it was your punishment that brought our peace. Jesus, that you were, you were beaten beyond recognition that we might walk in complete wholeness. And Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your love poured out for us without any, any limitations. And right now, Lord, I pray, Lord, for an overflow of your love, that the river that flows from the throne would begin to flow towards every person that is receiving right now in Jesus' name. And even those online, if you're online right now, just lay your hands on your head right now. And we say in Jesus' name, anxiety, you must bow right now, Lord. God, I thank you for Devin, Lord. I thank you for him raising his hand. God, I pray right now in Jesus' name, that which has tried to chase after him would be lifted in Jesus' name, and he would be released as the prophetic voice that he is, God, to bring peace, to bring stability, and to restore the order of God. Yeah, right now with your hands and then release the government of God, the government, the authority of the Lord to bring into order anything that is, um, that is out of order. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And we break off any shame that has been attached to this. We say no to shame and we just release right now the joy and the peace of God. And we declare that you are enfolded in His arms. Thank you. Oh, just receive right now to say, Jesus, I receive your peace. I receive your love. I receive it as a free gift. I don't have to earn or strive. I can receive it as a free gift, Lord. We thank you for the free gift of grace and peace. Oh, I For thou, O Lord, for thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth, thou art a 
we declare hometown victories. Hometown victories in this room and online that we would begin to bud the first fruits of faith in the Christ. As you said to Peter, who do you say I am? He said, you are the Christ. You are the sent one, the reconciler, the redeemer, the victor, the king. We thank you, King of glory. We bless you, God. We bless what you are doing. We bless what you will continue to do. God, we thank you that anxiety today was broken. We thank you that depression was broken. We thank you that you are releasing even grace on parents. The Lord is releasing grace on parents as you parent your children. There is a fresh patience and a fresh peace. And within your marriages, some of you, you felt at edge uh, with one another, on the edge of just kind of this like uh, bickering. And the Lord is silencing that with His peace tonight. Thank you, God. We thank you for your presence, Lord. Church, can we just lift up His name together? Hallelujah. 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 Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I receive that for myself. I receive the hallelujah of Christ, the risen King, for myself tonight. Oh God, we thank you. We love you. We're going to um, transition into something right now. <laughs> so uh, you can find your seat on the floor in your, in your chair. Really, anything goes tonight. Woo, Woo hallelujah. Woo. Is that okay? So, do, do, do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I'm gonna ask if we can just stay in this place actually. Thank you, Lord. I'm, I don't mean don't be joyful. I just mean stay in this place. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. <laughs> We're gonna um, bypass some of the formalities tonight and just go straight into the Word. If the Lord is um, touching you tonight, I ask that you stay and receive that, that you just, um, you don't try and move past it tonight. But I do believe there is more. We've been doing Vision Sunday this week, talking about the vision of our house, and obviously we're building an incredible building. And um, tonight on my heart, I want to talk about a resting place for the Lord. I wanna talk about what it means to be a resting place and um, if you didn't get to see the video for Arise and Build, I encourage you to go watch it online this week. It is so powerful. Listen, Bethel Church, we are, we are called to believe God and take Him at His word. We are people that believe that heaven comes to earth, not someday, but today. And it's not by might nor by power, but by His Spirit. And um, I wrote these questions down that I, I wanted to start. Thank you, God. I just want you to take a moment. Obviously, the Lord is in this room, and we, we want more. We want more of you, God. God, there is a desire in our hearts for more, but a recognition of a need, God. 
not because you withhold, Lord, but because you're moved by our longing. Thank you, God. And I ask this question. I, I want you to ask your heart, have we experienced all that God has to offer? Are we walking in the fullness of what he has promised? Could the supernatural call on your life be initiated, be catalyzed with your attitude and your belief? And could we make decisions according to a response? I ask that like, because I sense the, the Lord stirring. I told Leslie I felt nervous to preach tonight, not uh, in fear, not like nervous, like I'm gonna get something wrong, but because I feel like we are in this place of holy invitation. Yes. And um, all of my life, I've been kind of this uh, interesting little prophetic kid that will feel things and I know nothing about what I'm feeling. I just feel it. And then the Lord's invitation leads me into this place of understanding. And this summer, all I was saying to my husband and to anyone that would listen, that poor man listens to me preach all the time. <laughs> But I, I said, I feel there's something on the tabernacle of David and the Lord is wanting to restore the tabernacle of David. And um, if I'm honest, I didn't really understand what I was saying. I just knew it was true. I didn't really fully grasp what I, I was declaring. I hadn't studied First Chronicles where in 15 and 16 where that began, but I knew it was true and it set me on this quest of what does it mean to establish the tabernacle of David and then we're sitting in a senior leadership team meeting on Tuesday and Chris is laying out the foundations of our house. He's laying out the places where we've come from. And he says, and Bill used to teach on the tabernacle of David as like a foundational point, as a stone in our foundation of a New Testament reality of who the church is meant to be. And then I thought, well, if Bill was teaching it, then I must be right. And the truth is that um, as I began to study and look at this, I began to, I mean, I began to, what a little noodle, you know, began. I feel like for centuries, people have grasped hold of biblical truths that the Lord is looking for a generation that isn't trying to come up with a new, uh, a new thing. Try, he's just looking for a generation that is willing to grab an old fire. And I keep hearing this phrase, new wine, fresh oil, old fire. I listened to a teaching about two years ago um, on the fear of the Lord, but it was titled, new wine, fresh oil, old fire. And uh, as the Lord reminded me of that, that line, I, I began to think, oh, the fire of God has been burning in the church for a lot longer than I've been alive. And as a generation, as a people who are alive today, the Lord isn't initiating a new fire. He is fanning the flame of a fire that has been burning in the church for generations. You know, Paul encourages Timothy to fan the flame that he received from his mother and his grandmother. I can tell you, standing up here, I received a flame from generations, I think I have a great, great grandfather who was awoken to the power of the Spirit in the Wesleyan revival. In my second year of school ministry, my sister found his Bible where the Holy Spirit had touched him for the first time and he wrote the date where the Holy Spirit had touched him and he was crying out. He said, Holy Spirit, possess me with a living flame. This fire didn't originate in our generation. It has been burning in the church, but the Lord is inviting us as a people to revisit the wells of revival, the wells that were stirred in a people. And as I, um, I started in Genesis, I, I started in Genesis in the study of of worship and the priesthood and where it all began. And so often, I don't know, I, I think that it like began in the New Testament. <laughs> and then you find God's intent all along was to raise up a royal priesthood from Genesis 1. Yeah. 
right at the very beginning in Genesis 1, where God says, let us make man in our image. Do you know that word image is the same word that is used for do not make an image of me. I wonder if God forbode us building an image of of God because he had already created the one who was going to bear his likeness in his people. That he had intended that through us living in his presence in the Garden of Eden that we would do something that no, no other part of creation could do. That he would allow us to reflect him. Are you with me, church? And he connects this bearing his image in Genesis 1.17 to work. (laughs) You know, I thought maybe when I would experience God's glory and leadership at its finest, I would become like a cherub floating on a cloud with some kind of pineapple juice. I would say pina colada, but we're talking about the non-alcoholic version, you know with a little umbrella in it, in a coconut. And uh, I would be uh, floating in the glory in heaven. And I began to realize that God's flame of love that began to burn in me was gonna give me more responsibility that I I could cope with on my own. (laughs) This word for bearing the image of God to subdue, to work, is actually the word that they use, Hebrew word work and worship. It's avada. To avada is that within this place that God created for us to walk with him, that our work would be a holy offering to him. You know, within the garden, so God creates this garden. It's the the first temple. If you look at the building out of the temple, Genesis 1, the garden is the first temple of God where his presence dwells. And in the garden, work was worship. And it was only when Adam and Eve rebelled against God and they were kicked out of the garden that work became toil. (laughs) Within the garden, within his presence, work is exponentially increased. It has a grace in it to catalyze and move us, to bless us, to overwhelm us with goodness when we are partnering with him in his presence. It is only when we are kicked out, when we were kicked out, removed from his presence, that work became toil, that the ground resisted abundance. And I believe uh, today what I wanna speak about is what happens within the presence of God for his people. I've been really rocked actually uh, by how much the Lord wants to abundantly bless his people. It is actually quite offensive to me (laughs) when I look at the word of God and I look at the, the intention of Genesis and not just then, you follow it through Abraham and you see it through Moses, you see it through the people that say yes to God. He lavishly blesses them. He builds houses for them. He extends their territory. He, he puts fruit uh, that, he, you know, you look at Ezekiel's river, it bears fruit all year round. There is something the Lord is wanting to shift in the church, in our mindset around what it is to live and move and have our being in Him. And it is all connected to our place with Him and to worship. You, you hear this all the time from our house, from other houses that, you know, we want to see a city blessed. We want to see a city transformed. We want to see nations reformed. And you know, God cares about cities. The whole Old Testament is full of cities. I'm gonna have to stay on track here. Help me, Lord. You know, we're talking about building a worship center down College View. And it's like, you know, I I think half the world was asking, is there even a point in building another center? Is church as we know it dead? Is this room as we know it? People, I heard people are saying in COVID, like, are we moving now to to a different kind of model? And, And you hear this as people start talking about reformation disconnected from what really truly brings momentum in reformation. And that is a body that worships. God. The momentum of reformation is found in the fire of the revived heart that is revived by the Spirit. 
The gatherings in this room is what sets the course of our heart. It's what puts the intention of our heart in alignment with the Lord. It what, it's what begins to put the seed of the kingdom in us that when we leave this room, we do not leave the presence, but we go with it and our work becomes exponentially increased because our hearts have been calibrated in adoration of Him. So God creates Adam and Eve. He puts them in this garden and their role is really to be priest kings, to minister and to love the Lord, to walk with Him and to rule and reign. And when they rebel against the Lord, they're kicked out and their royal priesthood is altered. It is, it is um, really the, the connection there has been severed. And now they're gonna live under the toil, under the, the weight of sin. But you watch as the Lord, I don't, I just, this is, this is what really gets me. I'm gonna have a hard time getting through this today. This is what really gets me as I go through the Old Testament coming to the culmination of Jesus Christ and the birth of the church is that no matter how much humanity gets it wrong and no matter how frustrated God gets with them, He always is finding a way to sneak in what is to come in what is not yet. It is the wildest thing. It's like He cannot handle being away from us. It's like he cannot take, it's like he knows that there's gonna be restoration. He knows that Jesus the lamb is coming, but he begins to paint this picture from the moment they're kicked out the garden all the way till, the, till Christ comes of a God that is looking for a resting place in his people. And he bends, he bends himself. He, he adjusts his heart, his mind. He, he adjusts, not his nature, but uh, I, how do I say this? He... Um, he doesn't adjust his nature ever. His nature never changes. But it's like he's like, he, he could be really mad. He could really say this is the end. He could really just flood us all and forget about Noah. But he's like looking for a way to be with us. And just when he gets really fed up, more mercy comes out of him. And, and uh, you see this in Moses. And uh, this afternoon I was really messed up in Moses. Uh, I'm supposed to get to David today, but we might just hang out with Moses. When I was praying about this message tonight, I believe that we will have more messages about the tabernacle of David to come. I, I really feel like it's gonna start permeating through. I think we're gonna see it start being spoken about within the house and outside but I felt like the Lord wanted to set a stage because it didn't begin with David. It began with God's intention to always walk with his people and to raise us up as a royal priesthood. And Moses, God raises up a deliverer in Moses and Moses, you know, he delivers the Israelites and he goes up on Mount Sinai. He goes up, I think it's eight times. And he goes up to meet with God in his presence and God is already planning a restoration of the priesthood. He has already, Adam and Eve failed. They were removed from the garden and God is already from Abraham. He's starting to woo us in. He's got this weird priest king called Melchizedek that shows up in Genesis and God's already painting this picture. Like there is a line of priests that is about to be birthed from man and he woos Moses up a mountain and the sixth time that Moses is in his presence, he gets this blueprint, one of the 10 commandments, but also of the priesthood. And he starts and he begins to talk to Moses about this, these priests that are gonna be raised up and what they're gonna wear. And uh, he comes, Moses comes down the mountain with this whole, um, this whole plan for the priesthood. And it is a mirror image of even the stones that were in the Garden of Eden. Now the priests are gonna wear because the Lord is wanting to restore this. And he comes down and Aaron, who is gonna be the priest, has already built a golden calf and has already failed. But what he has in this blueprint is these beautiful white linen robes. And the reason why the priests wore linen was because you don't sweat in linen. Because in the presence of God, what we do, we cannot bring our own human striving, our own sweat equity into. 
It has to be in surrender. And these priests are wearing these white linen garments and they have these crowns on their head and they have gold and blue and these jewels and gems that every time they minister in God's presence, they literally shone. They were like the shining, radiant, beautiful man of God who would minister before the Lord. But when the priests were not in ministry, they weren't wearing these shining garments. Are you following me? Okay. They weren't wearing these shining garments. And you see, this is what got me today. You see on the eighth time Moses goes up. Something about his connection with the Lord. You know, God gives him this blueprint to, for what the priests are gonna wear. But something about Moses' connection with the Lord, he comes down the eighth time and he doesn't realize it, but he himself is now glowing. It's not a priest that will glow when he's in the ministry in the tabernacle with the ark. Now Moses has met with God and is carrying a New Testament revelation in an old covenant reality. And as I was reading this today, I was just thinking, God, all along you have wanted your church to come into your presence so that we could glow and shine with your glory. All along you have been wanting to invite us into this place and you stopped at nothing to get us there. When I asked the question of have we experienced everything, it's not this question of like, oh, we're not doing a good job and oh, you just failing at life and we haven't experienced everything. It's, it's not that feeling. Sometimes I think we hear those things and it feels like, uh, like someone saying what we're not. I ask the question because I feel this invitation to who we are. A lot of people, they say like, isn't God's presence everywhere? Why do you care about the manifest presence of God? And I was thinking in worship today, well, God's presence just for a metaphor everywhere is like the moisture in the air right now. There is water, H2O, in the air right now. Where we go out this room, there'll be moisture. If you go to Florida, there'll be more. <laughs> but that same water that is affecting and hydrating our skin and we're experiencing in a measure I could take Cassie and dunk her in the water and it would be a very different experience from what the water she's experiencing now. The reason why we long for the manifest presence of God is because there's a big difference between the water we're experiencing now and getting baptized in it. And the Lord is looking for a resting place. He is looking for a people devoted to Him and within that devotion, he will put a purpose in you. Bill spoke this morning about how sometimes our gifts are not always aligned perfectly with our purpose. We're looking at what we're good at and we're thinking what we're good at is gonna tell us what we're gonna do. You know what I'm good at? I'm good at watching Survivor on the couch while eating chocolate <laughs> lava cakes. I am, I'm really good at it. It's the Rugby World Cup right now. I'm really good at watching rugby. Do you know what I'm not the greatest at? Is feeling like a powerful leader. Mm. I always, you know, I was waiting for that moment. And I found in God that he wasn't so interested in what I thought I was. He was really interested in my availability to what he was calling me to be. And as I began to look through the old covenant for this blueprint of what we are to be as a holy priesthood, as a royal priesthood, a holy nation, I began to see that the Lord has specific ways he wants to do this. And you know, it's not maybe the ways of man. And I want you to open with me to 2 Samuel 6. Now, 
This is a pretty, um, this story gets a lot better. Second Samuel 6, it's also First Chronicles 13. I just, for all you theological nerds like me, Second Samuel 6 is narrating the same story that First Chronicles 13 and 14 and 15 are narrating. Chronicles is much more in depth and detail. Second Samuel is kind of bringing heart and thought and concept and introducing us to the story and Chronicles is where you'll get all the details. And I felt, I said to the Lord, like, can we just go to the tabernacle of David where we talk about this joyful expression of worship and praise? You see, Moses did establish a tabernacle. He established the Ark of the Covenant, but it was all around sacrifice. It was all around awareness of sin, pain, uh, where humanity have failed. There was lots of death in the tabernacle of Moses. But David grasps a New Testament reality that should not really have existed in his time. But sometimes the journey to apprehending what God has for us is just that, it is a journey. And it is one that is marked with both triumph and failure. And I I said to the Lord, can we not just get to the praise part, the exciting part? And the Lord said, that is coming for the church. But I need my people to know that success isn't always based on this first outcome, but success is based on the continuous pursuit of my heart despite obstacles. If If in the presence of God, work is worship, that means that as you step in and allow the Lord to grip your heart and let Him pull you in to what matters to Him, it means that there's going to be work and responsibility and things that are beyond our capability. But as we lean in to partner with Him, He is gonna teach us His ways. And His ways are higher than our ways and His ways are perfect. And in uh, 2 Samuel 6, David has been named king and he has been longing to restore the ark back to Jerusalem. So the ark in 1 in Samuel 6, not 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel 6 was stolen by the Philistines. They ended up with a plague. I believe it was hemorrhoids, which is kind of unfortunate. <laughs> I, the Bible is so interesting. They, the Bible said that, not me. Uh, they had stolen, they'd stolen the ark. The Philistines had recognized that the ark gave something to Israel that they wanted. It gave them victory. It gave them power. It gave them prosperity. And so the Philistines take this ark and they try to set it beside their gods and all their gods fall and then they end up with hemorrhoids and they just realize this is a really, this is not a good thing to have this here. And so they go and um, they go consult their divinators, their, their magicians, they're pagan priests, and they say, what do we do? And the pagan priests are like, listen, put the ark on a cart. Two, yoke up two, I think it's heifers, that have never ever pulled anything before, two milk cows, I believe. Yoke them up, and we're gonna let them take a walk. And if they wander back to Israel, we're gonna recognize this wasn't just by chance, like we, we have taken the wrong thing. And if they just wander around, we'll realize it just was by chance that we all ended up with this awful plague. <laughs> and uh, they put like gold tumors on there and gold rats all unto their gods. It's all connected to their gods. And they, they put the ark on and the ark goes back into, goes back to the Israelites. Now fast forward, so the ark ends up staying. It's not in Jerusalem. Saul didn't really care super much about the ark but it's been waiting there and David now wants to restore it to Jerusalem. I'm gonna paraphrase, is that okay? He wants to just restore it to Jerusalem and he kind of gathers the elders and all the leaders and says, hey, do we wanna do this? And like, we wanna do this. But here's the problem. They decide to put the ark on a cart. Now, when the Philistines put the ark on the cart, 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 <laughs> the ark on a cart, Nothing bad happened to them. Nothing, nothing bad happened. Because they weren't supposed to know. But Moses had received law from the Lord that the ark which carries the presence of God, the mercy seat on top of it, is only supposed to be carried on the shoulders of Levites, of worshipers, of priests. 
But it doesn't say here in the story, but I guess someone thought, well, if they did it, I guess we can. Well, work for them. So I guess it could work for us. And they probably reasoned their way through. Well, Jerusalem's hilly, it's, we gotta get up there. It, it's probably really tough and treacherous. Do we have to really weigh this on our guys? We could do it a lot quicker. I'm sure a lot of people reason. Anyway, they put the ark on, an, on a new cart, which their friends just got away with. Well, the enemies just got away with. But this time, the ark is, the, the oxen stumble and Uzzah touches the ark and he dies. And David is mortified and he's like, I cannot, how can I restore this back? He's, he's upset with the Lord, he's in pain. I think he's feeling great guilt and remorse because he should have known better. And the ark stays there in, in, the, um, in Obed-Edom's house until David a few months later decides he's gonna restore the ark. This is what I wanna say to you today is that no matter who you think you are, where you think you've been, what you think you've done, what your gifts are, what your talents are, what they aren't, what you aren't, the Lord has not made provision for His presence to be carried by a man-made cart. He doesn't wanna put His presence on the latest and greatest influence. He doesn't wanna put His presence on the greatest marketing strategy that comes from the world. He doesn't wanna put his presence on necessarily the greatest orators or articulators. He wants to put it on priests and Levites, on people who have given their whole lives to the Lord and said, I want to minister to you day and night. And it's on the shoulders of those people that it is carried. And you actually see when David brings the ark back into Jerusalem, the second time he says it must be carried on the Levite's shoulders. And you know that every six steps they took, the seventh, they sacrificed an animal. I mean, just for all you nerds right here, the, uh, the, the creation story was done in seven days. The number seven here is very important because it is the reestablishment the temple in Eden is now about to become, we're about to set, take the ark back and build a temple in Jerusalem. God is about to restore his original design in creation through a priest king. And when this ark is carried on the shoulders of these Levites, David puts on a linen ephod like the priests were supposed to wear. He was a king. He wasn't supposed to be dressed like a priest. He was supposed to be dressed in kingly robes, but he put on the priest's garments and he begins to dance before the presence of God. And we know that Michael, she, she, uh, she criticizes him. She criticizes him. But David in this moment is carrying a prophetic sign. He is walking as a prophetic foreshadow of what is about to come, which is the restoration of priests and kings, of a royal priesthood, a holy nation that will dance before the presence of God and usher him in to restore what God always intended. Are you with me? The Lord is desiring a resting place. The Lord is desiring a people who want to look to Him and not to the methods of man. The Lord is desiring hearts that are contrite and humble. And you may not be very impressive on the outside, but that is not what He's so interested in. He's looking for an inward purity an inward set of partners. And there is a reformation that is coming. I was trying to, I wrote about it at the end of the book I just released, a reformation that is coming, I believe, to the priests and the prophets. You see, the priests, they minister to the heart of God and they take the heart of God and they minister back to the people. The prophets are responsible to hear the heart of God, to carry it and to release it to the people. There's a reason why for the last 20 years, Chris Vallotton has been adjusting the prophetic movement to be one that carries the goodness of God. And there is, a, there is an invitation for us. And it's not an invitation for Sunday night. It 
it's an invitation for beyond this moment. You see, sometimes in these moments, it feels good, you know? It feels powerful. But the reality is that God isn't coming back for an anointed person. He's coming back for a bride. I was reading in, in Acts. I'm sorry, I can't remember. I was reading a few chapters this last week. I think it's around Acts 15, where the Greeks think Paul and Barnabas are Hercules and Hermes, I think, or something, Zeus and Hermes. There we go. And they're trying to sacrifice animals to Paul and Barnabas. And they're like, no, 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 we're trying to preach Jesus here. <laughs> it's about Jesus. It's about but I have this concern sometimes that we as the church have become so used to sitting and listening that we have relegated this work of the priesthood to the person we think is most anointed. That we are relegating the ministry to the Lord for the most gifted where the Lord is actually beckoning us all to come in. Thank you. In Psalm 110, David says this line. He says, the Lord says to my Lord. <laughs> that is confounding. The Lord says to my Lord. Is that a small L or a big L? If you look in the Hebrew, it is Yahweh says to Adonai. David in the Old Covenant, pre the cross, pre-resurrection, pre-ascension, and pre-coming of the Holy Spirit has seen Jesus. The Yahweh, Yahweh, King of all, I am, that's why saying, I am who I am, says to the one that is sitting on his right hand, Jesus, the Messiah, David's Lord. My Lord says to my Lord. There is a revelation that David had outside of his time where he saw Jesus and he began to usher in the heart of God before the season was appointed. There was such a connection in his heart to the Lord. In 1 Samuel 2, 35, the Lord has just said He is done with Aaron's line. He is done with the priesthood as it is. They have failed Him. They have broke His commandments. He said, you will no longer go before me. And then He says, but I will raise up one who will do what is in my heart and in my soul. He is prophesying. It's an unknown prophet prophesying David. I will raise up a priest king who will begin to reestablish the order of priesthood and he would be a foreshadow of what is to come. People that will see the Lord. People that will know Yahweh and will see Adonai. People that will come into His house and never have to depart. You see, the glory that was on Moses in 2 Corinthians, I believe it's 3, says that that same glory that was on Moses that he had to veil, now we with unveiled faces, beholding His glory. About a year ago, I was driving in the car and I said, Lord, make me holy like You are holy. I want to be holy like You are holy. Set me apart, God. I have to have You. I don't want any blemish or anything, any ulterior motives, God. Make me like You. And He leant in and He said, cry out for my glory. I said, Lord, I, I don't want to cry out for Your glory. No one touches Your glory. I want to be holy. And he said, but my glory is your inheritance, Haley. There's a lot of people in this room 
that you aren't sure if the glory can be your inheritance. But the Lord is ushering back a worshiping people, a, a royal priesthood dressed in a linen ephod, covered in shining garments, but more so that their skin would be able to glow with His glory because they've been with Him. If you wanna talk about innovation and cities alive and transformed and reformation in the world, there is no reformation without the restoration of the priesthood, the hearts of those who want to minister to the Lord. The Judas spirit will always say that your lavish love could be spent somewhere else. There will always be ones who will say that you could do this somewhere else, somewhere else. But those that are in love know that it can only be spent in one place. From Genesis 1 through Revelation, God has been looking for a resting place. And this is what I believe the call on this house is. I long for the day where I will see Jesus face to face. I long for the day where the new Jerusalem is here. But I hope that that isn't a reason to forsake my responsibility now. To take what is meant for one day and through my affection and my love and my ministry to His heart, begin to draw Him in to dwell with a people to begin to draw His mercy, to begin to, to say, God, if you are looking for a place, God, here's one. Sometimes it's hard to stand up here because many of you don't know who I was once. Cutting hair for 10 hours a day in a salon, preaching the gospel to whoever would hear. Crazy 19 year old who would cut hair for 10 hours and then drive to youth still with people's hair poking my body because it's in my clothes because I was so hungry for the Lord and I, I didn't know any better. And I wasn't a preacher or an orator or a revivalist. I didn't even know what revival was. Packed my bags to come to a church thinking I was gonna learn about history. It said it on the website, history of revivalists. Instead, people were, there was a guy prancing around with a fiddle talking about being a lambkin one day. And I was like, it's <laughs> no one like Georgian, man. Such a gift to the bride. Worship doesn't have a method. It doesn't have a, f uh, a fixed form. David established these forms that we would follow in order to, to, to carry the heart of God. And as they would step into formation, the glory would come. Could you imagine when the temple was built, when Solomon built the temple and the streets were filled with 4,000 musicians and worshipers? That's four times, probably five times what is in this room right now, skilled musicians and worshipers. I'm prophesying right now, I'm prophesying, the Lord is raising up worshipers in our midst. He is raising up shepherds and ones that have been in the fields whose hearts are attuned. We have seen extraordinary things in worship, I believe in the last 20 plus years. We have seen extraordinary shifts. It's what brought me here, watching Kim Walker Smith go after God on an album when no one else knew who she was. It's what brought me here. But church, have we seen the fullness? And we can treasure, it's not, about, um, it's not about pushing aside what has happened or even diminishing. We would be foolish to diminish what has happened. What has happened has been profound, but it is the, the birthplace, it is the foundation, it is the ceiling that is gonna become our floor if we will remain soft in our hearts to the Lord. Caleb, I see you over there. You're catching my eye this whole night. 
a man of God, a man called after his own heart, a man who carries the gospel that burns in you, an evangelistic anointing, but inside of you also is the heart of David. And I believe the Lord is gonna do something in you for your nation. I believe as the Lord raised up Matt Redman and Tim Hughes, as he, as he raised up Soul Survivor to call a generation to worship and minister before his heart, I believe that the Lord inside of you is gonna to begin to stir you. And that stirring is gonna to lead to an intercession and that intercession into a cry, the same cry that David said, I will not rest until I have found a house for the Lord to dwell in. And I see this cry in you, Caleb, and it is a cry to call people into the heart of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Brady, I see the same thing on your life, the call of David on your life and this anointing to build and to see heaven come to earth, Brady, when you crack open your heart before the Lord and you allow people to see the real, authentic, raw part of who you were made to be. I, I feel like your weakness sometimes is easy to show, but your strength and your passion and your desire for the Lord, that is vulnerable. But in that place, the Lord says, I have found a resting place. Brady, the Lord is gonna give you blueprints to begin to build the house for the Lord to rest in. The Lord is gonna give you tools for the hearts of Levites and worshipers. And it's gonna to begin to, you're gonna to begin to shepherd. There's a shepherd's anointing on your life to shepherd people into the place of laid down devotion to one thing. And it might feel like you are forsaking 10 other things for one thing, but that one thing will become the avenue for a thousand. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Let's just invite the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. I feel the Lord right now. Caleb in the back, right in the back. Caleb, the Lord has called you for such a time as this. I'm thinking of Joshua and Caleb who saw fruit when others saw giants. And Caleb, there's been places that you've had to go alone because others saw giants when you saw fruit. But the Lord is gonna raise up a company of worshipers and believers and not just worshipers, Caleb. The Lord is gonna raise up a multifaceted group around you of different gifts and anointings that it was gonna become this like foundational. It's like the prophets, apostles, evangelists, pastors and teachers as the foundation that will equip the saints to do the work of service, to become a mature man. And Caleb, I see the revelation of Christ, the mature man beginning to flow through the songs you write and the words that you speak. Thank you, Lord, for this John the Baptist, Lord. Thank you for this man, this John the Baptist, who's crying out from a desolate place, Lord, to prepare the way, to prepare a place for Jesus to ride in. This John the Baptist to carry a Jesus movement into Gen Z and Gen Alpha. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. We just turn your attention. Just begin to sing out in the spirit or pray out in the spirit. Thank you, God. Oh, God, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, the Lord. Right now, there is a wind beginning to blow through this room and it is fanning an old flame. The flame that was fanned in the old revivalists in St. Francis of Assisi and Evan Roberts and Catherine Kuhlman. Uh, he's beginning to fan this flame that was birthed in the Hebrides revival, this flame that burned in David, the flame that burned in Moses. Holy Spirit, let the wind of your spirit come and fan into flame a hunger and desire for you, God, a, a desire to hide in your heart, Lord. Hannah Montesi, are you in this room? Hannah Montesi, are you in this room? She right there? Yeah. Thank you, Lord. I, uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just see, Hannah, I just see on you, um, I think I got your last name wrong, but thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you for the prophetic anointing on this woman, Lord. I thank you for the anointing, God, to come like an arrow and pierce through the mud. I, there is a intensity about you 
that you have wondered if you should tone yourself down or dial yourself down and you felt this need sometimes to apologize or hold back because your intensity, uh, it bugs you uh, and it bugs people. <laughs> Uh, but I feel like the Lord is asking you the question, will you pay a price to carry my intensity? That intensity that is inside of you is not your own. It is my heart. You said yes to me as a teenager to burn in you in a way that few have said yes. And I took you at your word and I put a ferocity of my spirit in you that is gonna provoke something in you, but it's gonna provoke a cry. And I, there is a, a prophetic anointing that is gonna come like a sword out of your mouth, but it's not to uh, destroy. It will be a sword to separate like the Word of God. The Lord is gonna give you uh, eyes to see the Word of God with such clarity and you're gonna know how to declare the Word of the Lord into moments, into people's lives and it's gonna to begin to separate soul from spirit, joint from marrow. There is a, a grace on your life to separate that which this generation has melded together. Soul and spirit, they've melded it together and they're calling truth that which is lies and you're gonna come with the Word of the Lord and you're gonna to begin to separate their soul from their spirit, their joint from their marrow and they're going to begin to discern the Word and the heart of God. We thank You, Father. Sue Marie, just lay your hand on her head. Thank You, Lord. Would You, would you baptize her in fire, Lord? Thank You, Holy Spirit. Oh, I, I hesitate to do this, but Carrie, I see a book coming out of you. I feel like this noble renaissance that you're carrying on the inside of you has got a part two. There's a second part of it, and there is a um, there is uh, this propulsion inside of you. There's almost this like holy angst inside of you, uh, and and there's like um, you are not willing to bow to certain things and you're not willing and there's almost been like you've wanted to start a war uh, against this and it's uh, the Lord is raising you up as a standard bearer, um, as a standard bearer and I see this guard over your mouth like uh, like eye guards, but it's it's around your mouth. And the Lord has asked you to guard that and you've said yes. And you're gonna start teaching the church to steer like a rudder, like the, 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 let the Lord steer the tongue of the church like a rudder. And um, uh, Carrie, there is this grace on your life to come with uh, tenderness, but with strength. And I see you beginning to move, uh, move pillars uh, that have been standing that are not of the Lord. And they're gonna come forward down, just like Samson who asked, can I have strength one more time, Lord, to move these things that are upholding old structures that do not serve yours. And I see the Lord, He's gonna give you strength in this season. And where the enemy has tried to almost undercut you in this last season, the Lord is gonna put a grace and it's gonna be by the Spirit. You're a mighty woman. You're a mighty woman with a lot of ability, but there's gonna be a God ability that is gonna come through you that is gonna be so beyond even what you could do on your own. And He's gonna carry you by the wind of His Spirit. Lord, I thank You for Carrie. I thank You that she's gonna carry. I see this immense weight um, that has felt heavy, but the Lord is about to lift up that weight and you're gonna carry the same, it's gonna be the same amount, but it's gonna be with a new grace. Lord, I thank You, Holy Spirit. Oh, and, and nobility is not in authenticity. Nobility is not in authenticity. It is authentic to the call of God. And you're gonna, I see just this, this articulation to realign. No, that isn't authenticity. That is having no gods on your mouth. Authenticity is living nobly before who the Lord says you are and letting your words follow that. So Lord, I thank you for that articulation. I thank you for this woman of God. I thank you that she's called by your name. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that she will mount up on wings like eagles, that she will run and not grow weary, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, uh, church, I still feel the Lord in the room, so I'm gonna keep going for a little bit. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord. Those of you online right now, I see this uh, intercession. Uh, I, I feel like uh, the people that 
attend church online, especially for Bethel in this season. I believe that there's gonna be an intercession that's gonna come from around the nations and the Lord is gonna start putting, whoo, I see flames of fire like in Acts beginning to descend in living rooms. Tom said he saw people in their living rooms getting touched and I saw this, like these flames of fire and there's gonna be an intercession and I saw, I see right now in the Spirit, I see myriads of angels joining the prayers of those around the globe to begin to usher in that which we cannot do in our own church. We would be foolish to think that we know how to minister to God's heart without the work of the Spirit in our lives. Oh, but with the Spirit, we can do what is absolutely impossible. Oh God, I just pray right now for those intercessors. You're watching right now. There's intercessors in your home and you've, you've gone unseen. And I don't, I, I don't believe the Lord promises that you will be known on the earth, but you will be building something that eternity will ring out in eternity. And your name may not be known on the earth in your lifetime, but you will watch as you stand in glory one day, how you moved mountains with your prayers, how you shifted things in the spirit. And I believe just like the woman who interceded for the Hebrides revival, the Lord is raising up intercessors around the globe who are gonna pray in a move of God spirit that is going to awaken the church and the and and the people of God to the power of Jesus well there's going to be a generation that's going to run through these doors and they're not going to know half the things about the Bible that we think they should know but they're going to be hungry for the real thing thank you Holy Spirit thank you thank you right now if you're in this room and you just you feel a stirring. You're like, I feel stirred to respond to this right now. I just want you to stand up where you are. You feel stirred. You need a, w- a wind of the Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Just stand and receive. Pete Mattis, I'm so sorry you're on the keys, but you've been on my mind the whole time. Peter, the Lord is about to 4 x your life. He's about to just four times it. And I know you're having a baby, but uh, it's gonna, I think it might even feel like this is really bad timing, uh, Lord, but it's perfect timing. And He's gonna 4X your life. He's gonna 4X the songs that you're writing. He's gonna, there's gonna be such, and it is connected to the Eden blessing. It is connected to the blessing of those who dwell in the presence of God, that He blesses those who bless them. And uh, there is gonna be a blessing that's not just gonna rest on you, but it's gonna rest on the people around you. And uh, and Peter, the, the, the impartation that's about to come from your life for lay down lovers, for worshipers is going to explode. Thank you, Lord, thank you. And yeah, th- there's gonna be teachings coming out of you that aren't just gonna teach and train, but they're gonna catalyze and mobilize. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Jesus. of the church is standing, so we're gonna pray. Oh God. This isn't just for worship leaders. It's just for lovers. Church, get ready for for worship sets and prayer sets to start happening in a new way, this in living rooms and I feel like the prayer house is about to come alive in a way. I feel like we're gonna start visiting the prayer house. The Lord is gonna remind us, I I need you to hear this with your spirit. The Lord wants to awaken things of old, not out of duty, but out of desire. And that prayer house is about to become a place, I can see it, it's like a birthing suite. I feel it in the spirit. It's about to start birthing the promises of God again. There are things in your life right now that have gone dormant and feel like maybe they are over. And it's gonna be in that place of givenness. Some of you are gonna go visit that prayer house and you're gonna start weeping over things that you haven't cried about for 20 years. Some of you, the Lord is about to cleanse your lenses. The gift of tears is about to come over the church to cleanse uh, any demonic uh, work off of our lenses so that we can see clearly. Holy Spirit. Oh, 
Oh God, I thank you, Lord, for a move of your spirit, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for Simeon here from Germany, Lord. I thank you for a move of the spirit in Germany that is happening, that is stirring, Lord. I thank you for Europe, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for Jean Luc and Ben Fitzgerald, Lord. I thank you, God, for a move, God, that you are birthing there, Lord. I thank you, Lord, all over this room, God. I thank you for Portland, Oregon, Lord. Anyone here from Portland, Oregon, the Lord right now, he's starting to do something in that region, Seattle, Washington as well. Lord, I thank you right now, Lord. Just receive, just receive in your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for Vancouver, Canada, Lord. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for Alberta as well. Holy Spirit, I thank you for Peru, God. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in the high places. Holy Spirit, and I pray right now, ooh, let the wind of your spirit let the wind come and blow in our lives and awaken. Oh God, I pray, Lord, that we would become intense about the things you're intense about, Lord. God, I pray, Lord, that You would awaken in us, Lord, this desire to minister to Your heart, that You would awaken worshipers that worship in spirit and in truth. Lord, I pray over this house, God, the wells of revival, Lord, the wells of revival that are stirring and moving, that they would be dug even deeper, Lord, that You would raise up as You raised up David, those who will do what is in Your heart and in Your soul. God, I pray for a little bit more chaos in church. I do. I pray, Lord, for a... <laughs> I pray, Lord, that we will be teaching on order in church because the church is coming so alive that we don't know what to do with the life in it, that we will be teaching order and trying to get people back in line, Lord. I pray that, oh uh, Lord, the Lord said to me the other day, He said, do you want the problems that come with a church that's alive? And all of a sudden I saw people I couldn't manage. And He said, will you complain about that or will you find it a joy and a privilege? And I had, to, I had to repent to the Lord for complaining about, the, about those things. And Lord, I pray that you would give us a patience. Oh. Yeah, church, just close your eyes right now. Just receive this. I can feel it. We're going to slow this down. Thanks, God. God, I pray for a holy patience for a box that needs to be eradicate that you would give us patience for that which is outside of the box that's what I pray I pray God that you would awaken your church God I thank you you are awakening your church I thank you that your church is awake that this church right now is alive and hungry oh Holy Spirit I know what you can do <laughs> God, I pray for radical encounters, God, in the night, Lord. I pray for the fear of man to die in the bride. I pray for a move of your spirit, Lord, not just within these four walls, God, but within the technology space and the education realm and the healthcare realm, Lord, that our love for you in this room would extend into worship outside of this room, Jesus. Lord, I pray for songwriters and musicians to rise up, Lord, who are seeking to gain one thing, and that is to know you, Jesus. God, would you fill us with your glory? Lord, we do, we pray that we would be holy like you are holy. But I also pray for a cry for our inheritance. God, I pray that we would cry out for our inheritance, that we would see incomparably great power for those who believe demonstrated, that we would see the sick healed, the dead raised, those who are oppressed and bound with demons set free in the power of the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would not settle for anything less than being a resting place for your glory. And God, I pray that we would have heaven on earth. 
that as David established a worship move that brought kingdom worship, throne room worship into an old covenant reality, that you would grace us with your mercy to extend the borders of what we have already received. That we would be able, God, to hunger and desire you that we would build upon the great breakthroughs we have already received that, Lord, we would not become satisfied, that we would delight in what you have done, but we would not be satisfied. That we would delight, we would find joy in what you have done. We would find great delight in ministering to your heart, knowing there is more. Thank you, God. Just real quick, if you're a worshiper, can you just raise both your hands up in the air like you're a musician worshiper? Thank you, Lord. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Oh, church, do you receive this? Oh, thank you, God. Woo, raise your hands up and receive with joy right now. There is a joy that the Lord is releasing into the service in His house. There is a weariness that is coming off worshipers right now. I can feel it, a weariness that this is tiring. Lord, would you release your joy, God? We receive, Lord. We want to be filled with your glory. We want to know your heart, God. God, you are building a house that will hold your glory. And we say, yes, Holy Spirit, would you apprehend us? Lord, we say we are coming for you, God. We are, you are coming for me and I'm coming for you. I keep hearing that scripture, the kingdom of God is at hand. The translation is, it is within reach, Lord. Yes, God, we receive, but we also reach. We receive and we reach, God. Today, we're reaching into you as you reach into us. God and we receive just receive his holy fire right now I just want you to say God I receive your holy fire I receive your great love I receive your mercy I receive your wind Holy Spirit I receive a passionate desire for more of your kingdom I receive it not by might nor by power but by the beauty of the Holy Spirit thank you God in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Somebody catch her. So good. Can we just give Haley a big hand? That was awesome. 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 How many of you guys received that for yourself? Woo! Come on. Massive joy coming. Hey, we just need people here from the ministry team. If you guys could make your way forward, we want to pray for anybody here who's needing prayer, who needs somebody to stand in agreement with them. Uh, students, if you could come forward, bring your badge, line up up front here. And uh, we just want to pray for anybody here who needs a fresh touch from God. Fresh touch. Is anybody here battling, anybody here receive a, a, a terminal, terminal diagnosis lately? I want to, I want to make sure we pray for you. Anybody here? Anybody here battling cancer? All right. Back here? Okay, we want to pray for you. Up, let, us, let us pray for you. Thank you, God. Right back here. All right. Thank you, God. We have a name that's above all names, including that one. Thank you, Jesus. We well, bless you guys. Have a... Oh, yes. The offering didn't happen. We, Bill, I'm sorry. We forgot to take the offer. Well, we didn't forget. We just kind of... We, we're going to... We're going to worship the Lord with offering right now. How about that? All right, officers, if you could make your way forward and bring the bags up, it'd be fantastic. And uh, okay, great. Wonderful. 
we're gonna say a declaration too because that's what we do listen nothing happens in the kingdom till it's first declared amen the kingdom of god is voice activated so what's the very first line of the first one and then i can take it from there it's blanking as we receive today's offering we are believing the lord for jobs and better jobs raises and bonuses benefits sales and commissions favorable settlements estates and inheritances interest and return checks in the mail finding yeah finding money debts paid off expenses decrease blessing and increase thank you lord for meeting all of my financial needs that i may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of god and promote the gospel of jesus christ hallelujah thank you lord thank you god thank you god praise god all right all right as you come to receive prayer bring an offering <laughs> put it in the bucket wait 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 <laughs> i need to reword that one Woo, i got myself in trouble no <laughs> i did not mean it that way <laughs> Come and receive prayer. <laughs> We're combining prayer and the offering. We don't <laughs> help me, Jesus. <laughs> Bill, I'm done. This is awful. This is not what it meant. You haters online, this is not what it means. <laughs> All right. If you need prayer, come get prayer. If you have an offering, give. Those two are not connected. <laughs> if you have no money, come get prayer as much as you want. You're not buying anything, people, all right? All right, they're done. God bless you guys. <laughs>